Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Amen. Well, go ahead and get your Bibles out. Hallelujah. And uh, we are uh, talking about the blood covenant. Amen. Praise God. And we're getting closer to finishing this up so we can walk into... Uh, I mean, walk into uh, the new term, segue. Now, that just lead, lead into, move over into uh, our, our teaching on the authority of the believer. Laying the foundation with the blood covenant, glory to God. We said last week that the blood covenant was not made with us, but with Jesus. Um, we talked about how the Abraham proved his faith by offering Isaac. Obedience made the covenant good. Heard somewhere recently that somebody said that the Isaiah 119 is not accurately translated that, you know, you, know, you don't have, to, it's not obedience and willingness. It was, you know, obedience was being at peace where you were. That's not, that, that's not so. Because the next verse says if you refuse and rebel, you know, you're not going to walk in the blood. So people, people, listen, you, can, you can't just get on word studies and get them out of context. Okay? Contextually, words have, uh, the other words around the word have bearing and meaning. And so you just can't take a straight, straight up definition it's just like um, when they translated um, John and James where it says, you know, and, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Well, it's really the word sozo there could be translated save, but it also can be translated heal. And obviously if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. The prayer of faith and the anointing oil, you know, his sins will be forgiven him and, and, and uh, uh, the sick will be healed or saved, but really healed. So the words around it and the context of words have bearing on words even when you do single word studies. And when there's a body of evidence of 2,000 years, you just don't throw it all out with the baby with the bathwater and say, ah, we got something new, we got a heavy revy. Just telling you that. Hallelujah. Especially since nobody else is teaching it that way. Except your new revelation. You know what I find about most new revelations? They're just old heresies rehashed under a different title. All righty. That went over good. Let's move on. So, obedience made the covenant good. What? Abraham had to offer Isaac, at least in the figure, in order to obtain his part of the covenant. Israel later broke the uh, captive, covenant, went into captivity. Jesus was obedient to the Father. Amen? Every point tempted like we are, yet without sin. He had a sinless walk. He was the perfect sacrifice. He sealed the covenant, and it was eternal and cannot be broken. God will not break, and Jesus will not break the covenant between God and the Father and the man Christ Jesus. Now, we can mess it up, but he can't. What's that mean? He, don't, we don't need another sacrifice. It's not like we had somebody come make the sacrifice. Oh, they messed it up. We've got to get somebody else. It's sealed forever with Jesus. So we, we, when you're in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen? Hallelujah. God cut the covenant with Abraham to bring forth the nation of Israel. God cut the covenant with Jesus to bring forth a holy nation. Amen. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You should show forth the praises of God. Amen. And I know we're a peculiar people. Now, I know we got that. David Eagle said that song, Peculiar, and getting more peculiar, which is kind of a cute song, but really the word peculiar and means purchased. We're a purchased people. We're purchased and possessed by God. I still sing the David Engel song. I'm peculiar and getting more peculiar. Walk around talking prosperity, living by faith with my spirit free. It's a good song, all right? David Engel stuff is great. I don't like the style. Who cares? When you get the word in you and it gives you faith in the time of need, you, want it, you need it, amen? It says some song that don't have any faith in it, and you say, what you like, it's the way it sounds. Then when you need faith, there ain't nothing there. That went over big. We enter into the covenant God made with, uh, with Jesus, uh, that Jesus made with the Father. We enter into that covenant through faith in Jesus Christ. David entered the old covenant by the circumcision of the flesh. We enter into the new covenant by the circumcision of the heart, the new birth. Romans 2.29. Uh, look over there. I know we're kind of running back a little bit over what we did last week, but not much, and then we're moving on. All right. He's a Jew outwardly, this, and, which is one. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the 
heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. In other words, our circumcision is of the heart, the new birth. It's not in the flesh. The, you know, the, the, the flesh and circumcision does not get us into heaven. All right? The circumcision of the heart, the new birth. Glory to God. So, so that we cut, God cuts away the old man of sin. There is an exchange of our lives. We, Jesus' covenant is with the Father. John 16. I'm, I'm blistering through this because I want to get to something. Y'all mind if I blister? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I just slowed down because I got to turn all these pages. All right, John 16. Starting in verse 14. He shall, glor he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while you shall not see me, and again a little while you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Jesus made a covenant with the Father when he went to the cross and God raised him from the dead. Jesus entered into that blood covenant with the Father on our behalf. He had to do it because he can't mess it up. You can mess it up. They can mess it up. I can mess it up. May have already messed it up this morning. I don't know. We could all mess it up, but Jesus can't. Amen? Why? He's, perfect. He's in perfect alignment with perfect harmony with the Father. Amen? Glory to God. Um, now, because he has that covenant, 1 Corinthians 3, look over here. One of the things that happens in that covenant, all things are ours when we come into the covenant with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 21, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's possessive, and Christ is God's possessive. Jesus belongs to the Father. We belong to Jesus. Amen? Now, if you think for a second you could do this outside of Christ, I want to be real nice. You're dumber than dirt. I like to say things like that because it really arrests people's attention. You know? I mean, hey, Pastor Ed, you really don't have to wonder where you stand with him. All right? If you think for a second you're going to get to be able to do this your way, you are this, look, God did not have a psalm that Frank sung and then Elvis sang called, I did it my way. I could not find, not the 157th or the 56th or the 52nd. There is no psalm out there called, and I did it my way. You got to do it God's way. I, you know, Frank lived his life. He did it his way, you know. I mean, it's cool, crooner sound and stuff, but it's not biblical. All right? You don't get to do it your way. And this is one of the things that people, people take some of the narratives that are being taught today. They think they can do it their way, and because they're under grace, they can get away with it and still get all the blessings of God. It doesn't work that way. You've got people coming along now, so the, the years and years and years after the Bible's been written, saying, uh, well, you know, uh, just one thing I saw yesterday, no such thing as hell. People don't get eternally. Really? What, what scriptures did you just kind of do away with? Because they, they did word studies. They got a revelation. The, they, the people who go to hell just absolutely perish. They don't even exist anymore. I do believe the word was called eternal damnation. Eternal. How long is that? Forever. People come, coming up with narratives that are, that are, that are non-biblical. That's why you need to be a student of the word. And just because somebody has done a word study doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. I'm being honest with you now. You know? You gotta take just beyond you gotta go, you know, you can't go get your little thing, sit up in your little room by yourself and come up with all these revelations and there's nobody to bounce it off of and nobody to, to judge it and to, to do whatever and you go out and teach it and then make fun of people who don't agree with you. Hello. And wear skinny see the problem with it, some of these guys are wearing skinny jeans and that's why they can't think straight. <laughs> just being silly. You will never catch me in skinny jeans. Now, that's just one of the things you will never see. Would you? Are oh, you saying anything? Okay. 
But all things are ours. Why? Because we are Christ and Christ is God's. It, but all things belong to us. Romans 8, 16. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Glory to God. Think about the blessing of being in the covenant with God. You're not just, uh, listen, Romans 8, 16. Um, and 17. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And the children of the heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. We have come into a place where we are joined together with Christ. We're an heir of God, but our heirship, that means that, you know, if you're an heir of something, you get all the blessings. Now, we know that the Kennedys, nobody up there pays taxes. I love it when people who don't pay taxes tell everybody else they've got to pay more taxes. Think about what the Kennedys get all those years. You know, we need to raise taxes on the rich. You're rich. You know why he said that? Because all their money is tied up in the estate. And because they're heirs of the Kennedy clan, they don't pay taxes. They live off of the estate. It's all in the estate. It's all, it's a, it's all hidden. They, you know, they don't pay any taxes. But they won't tell you, you've got to pay taxes. Something's not right about that, is it? We think the rich ought to pay more money, but pay their fair share. Okay, pal, how about Annie up? Go right, you know, I, I just, it always bugs me, you know. They come up and they tell everybody the rich people aren't paying their fair share, and then they're not doing it because they're living off the estate. They don't own the estate. The estate pays for itself because there's a big dowry from the illegal bootleg liquor. Anyway, that's how the, that's how the elder of the Kennedys got all his money was running bootleg liquor back in Prohibition. They put, it all in the, they put it all in a trust fund, and now they live off of it because they're now politicians. But my point was not that. That just kind of came out. <laughs> my point is that when you're an heir of something, you have access to everything that's, that, that is there. And everything that God has for you, you're an heir to. And you're a joint heir with Christ. Whatever Christ purchased, we're a joint. If you're a joint heir, joint doesn't mean lesser. It means joint. Okay? If you, you know, uh, people who have divorced, who are divorced and have joint custody of their children. You know, it's equal. It's not like one week visitation here and that. If they're joint custody, it's equal. You, know, you have to go half and half, um, that kind of thing. So when you're, a, when you're a joint owner, it's not a joint owner, but a joint owner. Now, you don't own a joint. You own a joint. You're joint owners. You don't own a, forget it. I'm not talking about marijuana either. Co-heirs, how about that? Equal heirs, Hallelujah. You're equal heirs with Christ to all blessings of God. Galatians 2.20. Now, we are in covenant, Father. All things are ours. We're joint heirs with Christ. But Galatians 2.20, For uh, I am crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now God, what is it? All I have belongs to God. See, it's not just everything God has is yours. It's everything you have is his. Including your will. Let me say that again. Including your will. One more time. Including your will. Including your acts. Including your life. Everything is God's. Paul wrote to the church and said, Offer your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your... Now, the King James uses the word, just about every other translation uses the word spiritual. King James says reasonable service. King James, I mean, but uh, most other translations, and the Greek bears it out, spiritual service. You cannot... Use your body to licentiousness, lasciviousness, to sin, to live any way you want to do when you're offering it as a living sacrifice to the Father. Yeah, but I was going through the house and then God told me such and such and such. I don't care what you said God told you. The Bible says, offer it a living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means everything I am, everything I possess, everything about me belongs to him. Now, here's the wonderful thing about it. God's a good God. He's not going to misuse your relationship with him to bring you harm. Everything he's going to do is for your good and betterment. To be able to make you useful for his kingdom. He's not 
going to hurt you. Every good and every perfect, James, every perfect gift cometh down from the Father above, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. They came to Jesus one day and said, Good Master. He said, Why callest thou me good? There is none uh, uh, good but save God alone. Now, his question was, Are you calling me God? But the fact he made a statement in there, God's only good. So God, you're in covenant with a good God. Amen? Now, if I walk up here and smack Nathan, I started to do that. I'm going to grab something up here bigger and hit you. And then I'm going to wait till you go to sleep tonight. I'm going to get a two by four. Why are you going to say, wham? Remember, some of you country foot remember, some of you country foot remember running from mama when she got the switch. Uh-huh. And she, she, you thought she forgot about it. Until you got in bed and got in your jammies. You weren't in your jeans anymore. You were in your jammies. And all of a sudden the light came on, the covers came back and whack, 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 whack. You got to go to sleep sometime. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll just sit in there wait for the eye to go. Mm. Well, that's not good for me to smack him. Either we hit him with a two by four in the middle of the night. That's not, that's not good. What's wrong? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. He's blocked. Block, block. This old man's got moves. Amen. It's, see, my, but my love for my son, I'm only going to do good for him. I don't do bad to him. I don't, I don't, do, I don't take advantage of him. I, I've got access to his bank account. I never take money out. I have access to his bank account for one reason. Put money in. And that's all I've done. For, that's all I did. I'm not going to have to after the, after the end of this month. Hallelujah. Thank God for jobs. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. It got so much that the bankers do. I could just call the bank and say, hey, Leslie, Kelly, Maggie, whichever one I got. I need it. How much money do you need to move, Mr. Taylor? Well, buddy, he's at the gas station. needs gas. I need to move money over there. Hallelujah. See, I'm, my access to his account was only for his good and to, and to help him, not to hurt him. I didn't get in there and he'd go, go to get gas. And the, there ain't no money there. Why ain't there no money? I'm oh, sorry, son, I wanted, to, I wanted to go eat. You took Mommy to Grand over today. I took your money. Well, of course, that might start happening now that he's got a job. <laughs> no. Dad's going to bless. Dad's going to honor. Dad's going to be good. Our Heavenly Father only does good. Amen? Even when he chastises you with his word, it's for your good. Amen. Are y'all here? But he's not going to do evil to you. So you can trust that as you yield your life to him in full. That's like we tell people all the time. When God says don't do something in his word and in, in his moral code, you think, well, we're not under the Old Testament law, but in reality, understand this, the Old Testament law does reveal the moral code of God. Now, I, know, I may not be living on thou shalt nots and thou shalt nots and thou shalt nots, but those thou, thou shalt nots tell me something about what God desires and God wants. Okay? So you can't run around and, you know, and, and drink, smoke dope, and carouse with women and do all kinds of stuff and think that's going to cause blessing to come into your life. It's not. And when God says don't do those things, it's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. In most cases, it'll kill you. I don't know how many we have on record of people dying from an overdose of Dr. Pepper. Because you get people going, drinking too much soda is just as bad. Really? How many, how many people have been down to the police department and pulled the records of somebody driving under the influence of Pepper? <laughs> Yeah, you know, cat, cat would cat would be uh, like you know in, in a uh, a um, Dr Pepper anonymous program. I'm in a pepper. I had my last pepper 30 minutes ago. It was the kind with high fructose corn syrup in it. No, how many people? How many people have been you know 
uh, under, driving under the influence of, of one too many tacos from Taco Bell. <laughs> I'm going to smack you again. See y'all next Sunday. I've lost this service. No. Now that said, well, it's just as bad to eat too much as it is to drink too much. No, no, no. You don't go out and kill people because you had too many tacos. You don't go. You don't. You don't die from overdose from you know eating a, a, a twenty ounce steak versus an eight ounce steak. But drugs will kill you. Hello. You get you get diseases from. Sex outside of marriage. You know the Zika virus? One of the ways is sexual transmission. Hello? I mean, almost all the, all the uh, sexually transmitted these STDs, well, no, all of them come from, you know, being outside the marriage covenant. Shoot me. People come all day and say, it doesn't matter anymore. Yes, it does matter. God has a moral code. And we need to follow the moral code of God. Because what? My life is his. And I am to live this life in your body. In your body, you are to live as a living sacrifice unto him. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Why? Because I'm in covenant with him. And see, we all come into church and we want the blessings. We want the supernatural debt cancellation. We want the, 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 we want the ointment, the anointing. Glory to God to come on us. Hallelujah. We want God to intervene. We want God to answer prayer. Then we turn around and start telling people they got to offer your body. I ain't into that, man. I'm into that grace message. Now, we're in a covenant. We've got to go back to covenant. I'm in a covenant. And therefore, my life belongs to him. Everything about me belongs to him. So what does that mean? And now, I'm not trying to earn my salvation, but I do live to honor and to please him. It's not going to, I'm not going to get saved because I did everything right. But I am going to live to honor him. Why? Because I'm in a covenant with God. And just as I anticipate and expect God to move in my behalf when I have need, he ex anticipates and expects me to live my life in a way that honors him. It's a two-way street. The narrative today, listen, it's the narrative that's entered in every, and in, 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 in it's a millennial narrative. Because everything about life is, I, I'm, I owe, I'm owed education, I'm owed a job, I'm owed this, I'm owed that. Crypt, get, crypt into the church, I'm owed blessings, I'm owed the prosperity, I'm owed this, and I don't have to give anything in return. Baby, ain't nothing free. I demand a free education. It ain't free. Now, you may not pay for it. Somebody's paying for it. Hello, it's not free. Somebody's paying for it. And let me tell you, if you get, if they start giving out free education, you may not pay for it now, but you will for the rest of your life because they're going to raise your taxes to pay for it. It's got to, the money has got to come from somewhere. Do you know what professors start out making? About 65000 a year. Start, not finish up. And you know how many professors on the college campuses? Hello? There's a buttload of them. It's a truckload of them. Should have said truckload. Okay? Basket full. There's a bunch of them. Somebody's going to pay for it. There's nothing for free. That mindset that you're going to get without giving is just wrong. And if you go through the Bible over and over and over again, God says, if you will keep my commandments, then I'm going to do this. Well, the New Testament is, it's not necessarily, I've got to keep the Ten Commandments. It is, my life now belongs to Him. So I live a living sacrifice unto the Lord. I keep my body under. I don't, Paul, Paul, the right, Paul wrote and said that to the Roman church, he said, don't, don't allow your members to become servants of unrighteousness. But make them servants of righteousness. So we're not talking about whether you get to go to heaven or go to hell. We're talking about walking in a covenant. Amen. And God says, I'm going to bless you. And you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. All things are yours. But now I'm his. And everything I do and everything I commit to should be in a way that honors him. My marriage with my wife should honor the Lord. Men, you don't treat your wife like she's a dog. 
Hello? I mean, there's a crisis in America of, of, of men being men. Hello? It's a crisis. And let, let me say this. And among the African-American community, it's beyond a crisis. It's a devastation. And that, quite frankly, comes out of Africa. If you go to Africa, you'll find out the women are dogs. They're treated like dogs. They're, they're basically domestic slaves. That mindset that the women are just simply there to please the men and that's all it's about, it, it, that, that mindset has carried over even into America. We need men to become men. You need to treat your wife like, like love your wife as you, as, as, just like you love the Lord. Amen? You love your wife as Christ loves the church and gave him, gives himself for it. Amen? Men won't have any problem with their wives honoring and submitting to them if they'll love them like Christ loves the church. Amen. And he honors his wife and he blesses his wife. Now you can't be all up in his face wanting to fight all the time and expect... Come on now, women. You can't be, you can't be doing all that mess and expect him to, to, to want to act right. But men, step up to the plate. Be a, be a godly man. Godly. Honor, honor her as the weaker vessel. I know the world wants you to think that women can do everything a man can do just like a man can do it. Get me the best male karate expert in the world and the best female karate expert in the world and guess who's going to win? I don't, I don't care what situation, whatever it is. You know, whatever it is, get the best of that male and female and see who's going to win it. Men are designed that way. Women are designed to be, the, to be what they are. This is not a male chauvinist pig statement. This is that we are, we have God-given roles in life. The Bible calls woman the weaker vessel. And women don't outlift men weightlifting unless they're, they're, they're juicing or using some kind of, you know, and they juice. They do these things, these competitions. You know, I mean, you got, you got two women now suing their insurance company because they want, they can't get pregnant. Duh! Of course you can't get pregnant. So they want the insurance company to pay for in, in vitro fertilization because they're, they're, they're not having babies. How dumb can you be? All right? Now, I said all that because of this. God blesses you, and God loves you, and God has made provision for you. Now, we are to honor the Lord. Just like when the man is do fulfilling his, his, his God-given role of honoring and loving his wife and taking care of her and treating her with goodness and kindness, and he's not slapping around. Man, if you ever slap your wife, I'm going to come slap you. And I'll bring the brute squad with me. Squad with me. We'll double slap you. You should, be hitting your, you should be hitting your wife. Amen. Now, I know some of them can get up in your face. You want to, but you shouldn't do it. What are you doing that to? <laughs> you do what the Word says. I did have one marriage counselor one time. I came out and told Janie, I said, honey, I, mean, I told her what the Bible says, but if I was married to her, I might want to hit her too. <laughs> <laughs> that's not I didn't tell him that <laughs> that was private with my wife oh my god <laughs> now I gave him the bible you can't ever do that <laughs> I was younger in ministry then I'm, I've matured since then I, I came out thinking, why submit to your husbands? Because they don't, they might hit you. Anyway, now, God always has our good. And I'm trying to use a parallel here. Marriage, God has our good at heart. God's looking for ways to bless you. And we are now, because he loves us so much and he does so much for us, it's not hard to honor the Lord when he's doing so much good for you. But we still have to. Do not listen to the people who get on television, get on radio and sell books that tell you you can live any way you want to and God's still going to bless you. 
That's unbiblical. And it's outside of covenant speak. It's outside of covenant thought. My covenant says in Galatians 2.20 here again, he says here, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to live my life in a way that Christ would live his life. I'm going to live. Well, Pastor Ed, I mean, I, I mean living that way and it's a tough on the flesh. Yep. And thank God John wrote, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There is a greater one on the inside who empowers me. Paul wrote and said, he said, when I am, he said, I'll rejoice in my infirmities, you know, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What? Paul wrote, the thorn in the flesh was not ophthalmalia, it wasn't some pussy oriental eye disease. It was that he had reached the inability of himself to do everything to honor God. And he didn't know what else to do. And God's strength was made of it. And that is grace. It's called strengthening grace. Not covering grace to allow you to get away with stuff. The grace of God to strengthen you to do what God wants you to do. Strengthening grace. From when I am weak, then am I strong. And Paul called it grace. When we reach our inability, when we've come to the end of it, oh, we can look to God and say, thank you, Father, that yeah, in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, in my inability to do everything you want me to do, I want to honor you. And I thank you, your strength overtakes. But you've got to work with that now, folks. You ever have people say, hey, then work with me here now. You know, you get into some political talk, and some of the people, it's, there's no working together. It's, it's, you've got to completely come over to my side. I'm sorry. I don't believe in the tolerance that we're being told we have to tolerate today. It's not tolerance. It's capitulation. People get up and demand that you tolerate everything the Bible says is wrong, and they say, and if you don't, then you're intolerant. But what they want you to do is not, be, and, and they're the most intolerant people on the planet. Because you say Jesus, you know, they, they go stark, raving, lunatic, crazy. You say Jesus in a school, can't do it. But then they got classes teaching people how to pray to, to, pray to Allah. And they've got, yes, that's happening in our public school systems. They're having Muslim days where they teach them how to pray to Allah. They're having days where they, they have to quote the, the, the prayer that, you know, Allah, there's only one God and his name is Allah. And there's only one prophet, his name is Muhammad. In the public schools. Where's the ACLU? Now, if we got in there and told them they had to pray that Jesus is, is the only begotten son, there's no way to come to the Father but by him, they'd be in there with a court case locking everybody up. Okay? So the world says, you know, you're intolerant. I'm not intolerant. And I'm, but I am neither, and I, but I'm, I, I am not tolerant for sin in the church under the guise that God's going to do something just because you, you know, you called on Jesus. I want to please God. You should want. You're in covenant, and see, we taught for years. You know, I'm blessed coming in and blessed going. We talked about all the things that God was going to do for us because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And then we come on and say, "Yep, now." Offer your body a living sacrifice. I don't believe in that stuff. Came out of the same book. Hello? The Bible is not an all-you-can-eat, choose-what-you-want buffet. Hello? It's the cafeteria putting stuff on your plate you don't want. And you got to eat it before you get to leave the cafeteria. I hate butter beans. They get slimy in my mouth. I hate the texture. Limas and butter beans. And black-eyed peas, that little dot on the black-eyed pea, I don't know if you know it or not, it's dirt. Because that's what it tastes like. I don't care if you put pork jowls or hog tongue or whatever else in there, it tastes like dirt. So does a first cousin field peas. But, you, you know, you always, you know, you had to go to school. You had to eat everything on your plate. And it seems like that day they doubled up on the, on the lima beans. And you're sitting there trying to chew on them, and they're just swelling in your mouth. Now, we all want the all-you-can-eat buffet and go there and get nothing but fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and not eat any greens. Ice cream, ooh, the soft serve, yeah. No, but, but chocolate syrup on them. 
Okay, Cap. You can have what you want. But see, the Bible's not that way. This is a well-balanced diet. There are blessings here. Hold on to me. Hold on just a second. I'm going to close right here, okay? Just don't, don't run away, okay? Y'all still here? A friend of mine, Jeff Walker, out in Palm Springs, put a, put a quote out here the other day. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There's a cell tower right there. Okay. Here's what Jeff, he posted this. He said, um, in theology, the divine human tension, that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a theological concept, the divine human tension, embraces the idea that only God can do his part and only believers can do theirs. And Jeff says this, Thus I quote T.L. Osborne. Anybody, anybody ever heard T.L. Osborne? Love Brother Osborne. There are two prayers God can't answer. Yeah. When we ask him to do what he's already done, or what he's already done in Christ, and when we ask him to do what he told us to do. Lord, save the world. Get your butt out there. I keep using, I better stop using that. Your derriere. You're back in. Take yourself out there. You're asking God to save the world. He's told you to go. Come on now. Lord, save the world. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. Every, why are you asking him to save the world when he's told you to go do it? He's told you to go preach. And why are you asking him to do stuff he's already done in Christ? See, what is this? There's a side, there's a God side and a man side. And if we're going to walk in the blessings of the covenant, God's already going to do his side. He's faithful that promised. Are you here? I believe we've got too many people trying to get God to be faithful to his promise and, and because they're not seeing answers, and the reason they're not seeing answers is they're not doing their side of the covenant. But they don't want to do their side of the covenant, so they keep putting it off on God, not doing what he said he would do. I'm trying to find my amen corner. Thank you. All right, got him. Amen corner just showed up. Can we get somebody else to join in? What do you mean, do my side? Live the, way, live the way God says live. Live by faith. Do the things God says do. Don't, don't try to circumvent it. Don't, listen, we, we, we got people teaching people, trying to teach people not to repent when they sin. Because of sin consciousness. The reason that they're conscious of it is because they did something that displeased the Father. And their heart knows it. So how do you fix it? You don't deny it. You ask God to forgive you. Why? Back to covenant thought. This is covenant thought. I'm wanting God to bless me coming in and bless me going out. Bless me when I lie down. Bless me when I rise up. Bless me in the city and bless me in the country. Bless me in the field. Bless me in everything I set my hand to. Bless my storehouses. I mean, bless, it. bless everything, Lord. And the thing is, he already has. But you can shut down the blessing by not walking in your side of the covenant of offering yourself a living sacrifice. Do what God says. Do the way God says. Do it. Being obedient to him. You got people sitting at home. I don't go to church. I watch it on TV. Why? The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. You don't get to stay home. I don't believe in church. You need a good smack. <laughs> you need to go get you a bottle of skin bracer and dump it in your hand and go, pow, pow. And go, thanks, I needed that. Some of y'all remember the old commercials. Skin bracer commercials. You got pow, pow, smack them, wake them up in the morning, and they say, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what are we going to do? I didn't get as far as I thought I was going to go today. 
All God has is at my disposal. All the resources, resources of heaven are uh, accessed through the name of Jesus. And then Psalm 91 is where we're going to pick up next week with the covenant blessings. Amen? But if we will do... And God didn't ask a lot. All God does is ask you to, to live your life. And if you're having a struggle, He'll empower you if you'll come to Him. That's the great thing. Here's what I expect of you. You're having trouble? I'll help you. Not, I don't have to do anything because he, he doesn't care. Yes, he does. He does care. But we're going to live in covenant. We're going to live in covenant relationship. We're going to live in relationship with God in a way that honors and pleases him. I'm going to take my body. It's going to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? When my body wants to do something it shouldn't want to do. I don't know. I mean, I haven't drank since I got saved. So I, I can't say, well, I, I, mean, I want to drink. I, I, I never smoked dope. Never did drugs. You know, um, try to pipe a couple of times because my dad did uh, about gag me. And I did. <laughs> Turn green. Well, that's not for me. But whatever it is, you know, whatever it is that comes up in life, I don't want to revert to something that I did in Egypt now that I'm in covenant with God in the land of promise. Amen? He brought me out of Egypt to bring me into the land of promise. And because they wanted to go back to Egypt so bad, they ended up going to captivity even in their own land by a bad king. Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving.